Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is October 8, 2021, and this weekend we're going to be doing a whole slew of Hanging with the Sock Dem Gang and Hanging with the Bread Tube Gang videos, in which we critique and comment on videos by other channels which are more social democratic or anarchist radlib in their orientation rather than Marxist communist as this channel is. All of us exist here on the broader left, depending on how you define the left exactly. And it's worth, while I think that there are some issues that we agree on and could work together on, it's also really worth remembering what the differences are and, you know, keeping a dialogue going uh, that is critical in nature, maybe to help people figure out what their positions are on different issues and what does a Marxist think versus what does an anarchist think versus what does a social democrat think. So that's what we're going to do. I also, on a larger channel note, have a bunch of Rosa Luxemburg audios still coming, uh, but I am working on Rosa's The National Question, which by the time it's done is probably going to be the longest thing on the channel. It looking like it's going to be about seven or eight hours probably. So that I may put up in pieces uh, just to get it out. Each of the pieces though, like a single chapter is like so far about an hour and a half. So we will see. But anyway, let's get into the first video for the weekend. Uh, this is from the Hanging with the Bread Tube Gang side of things. This is Anarcho Pack and a video called Anarchism as a Way of Life. Now, I have not watched this video before. Oh, and I should mention my Bread Tube methodology. Basically, I just go to the Thought Slime channel and then I click on Channels and see what Thought Slime is linking. Same way that I do the Sock Dem Gang videos. I go to Kyle Kalinske's channel, see what Kyle is linking, and I just, you know, Look through the last week or two of those videos, see what's new and relevant. Okay, so anarchism as a way of life. Um, what is this all about? You know, I am familiar with anarchism. I just, I haven't just been reading Marxist literature this whole time. I had a sort of brief anarchist phase where I considered these ideas. And I will tell you flat out, a lot of it for me was, uh, I was dissuaded from being a Marxist by a lot of older people telling me, Communism's dead, Soviet Union's done, blah, blah, blah. Also, Orwell, blah, blah, blah. So it was kind of a lot of communism is dead and sort of like leftover Cold War propaganda that even though I had been introduced to some of the ideas of Marx and thought they made a lot of sense, I was really dissuaded out of doing it, uh, you know, getting more involved in that, becoming a Marxist per se, like really doing the work to study to become a Marxist. And um, I, you know, flirted with anarchism for a while. And really, after not very long, I was like, how does this work? How do anarchists actually take power? It didn't really make a lot of sense to me. And then I moved back to Marxism and I was like, fuck it. You know, whatever kind of shape the world of Marxism is in, it just makes more sense to me to go that way. And, you know, we use the hashtag Revolution 2030 here at this channel. Uh, that represents the idea that if we really push now, we can get a sizable communist movement by 2030. And that's sort of the idea is to maybe, you know, be big enough to make waves in the next 10 years because we're going to need it. Uh, the U.S. is coming apart at the seams. There's threats of war with China over Taiwan. U.S. is starting to arm Australia. It's getting pretty crazy. I think the U.S. would lose that war, but it still wouldn't be good. And it would also leave the U.S. very exposed uh, and very ripe for change, let's say. So getting that movement together now is important. So why not anarchism? Well, the title of this video, Anarchism as a Way of Life, uh, I mean, there's a couple of ways you could go with that. There is, of course, lifestyle anarchism, which is uh, very, very individualistic, you know, dumpster diving and different ways to sort of beat the system on an individual level. Of course, though, what we actually have to do is confront and dismantle capitalism, right? Because you know, you look at, for example, um, the U.S. Congress has like single digits approval levels. They don't just stop existing, though. You at some point uh, have to confront them with a challenge to power. That's the idea. So, you know, individual lifestyle changes really isn't going to cut it. Also, on the other side, uh, I mean, you know, and before somebody's like, well, you're strawmanning. No, I haven't watched the video yet. We're going to do that in this video. I'm just saying it's an ironic choice of words given that lifestyle anarchism is a thing. But where I think that the video probably is more likely to be coming from is that 
you know, anarchism is this ongoing process of defeating hierarchies and keeping everything as flat as possible on an ongoing basis and prevent a state from ever reemerging and blah, blah, blah. Uh, the basic Marxist critique of anarchism, which I came to organically and then was like, oh, is that what Marxists think? Well, yeah, I guess I was a Marxist all along then, is um, you can have different social structures in your society based on the level of development that you have. And it's not just merely a personal choice. This is utopian thinking. Uh, utopianism is when you try to embrace ideas that aren't necessarily supported by the level of technological development in your society. So um, yeah, one of the big turnoffs for me about anarchism was that there's this huge a priori uh, you know, push against hierarchies, which is, basically shooting yourself in the foot, like things that you're going to have to do to defend your new order, you're basically ruling out off the bat. And I don't know, I mean, you know, from here we get into like Lenin's criticisms of it's basically bourgeois ideology just turned on its head. And yeah, it's very individualistic. Anyway, with all of that said, uh, you know, this whole anarchism as a way of life, uh, we're not really doing this just as a lifestyle change. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, trying to confront and defeat capital on a global scale. This is really a lot more than you can do in your backyard, you know, and I'm not really sure that the way of life, uh, I think that this is kind of childish looking at it this way. All right. So with all of that said, uh, you know, I, I'm just being upfront about what I'm bringing to this video. You know, my understanding of anarchism and past experiences with people making arguments that, you know, I would be anticipating here. Uh, you know, just being upfront about what I'm bringing to watching this. So let's get into the video now. Hi everyone. In 1925, the Italian anarchist Enrico Malatesta wrote that Anarchy is a form of living together in society, a society in which people live as brothers and sisters without being able to oppress or exploit others, and in which everyone has at their disposal whatever means the civilization of the time can supply in order for them to attain the greatest possible moral and material development. And anarchism is the method of reaching anarchy through freedom without government, that is, without those authoritarian institutions that impose their will on others by force. In this passage, Malatesta distinguishes between anarchy as a goal and anarchism as a method of achieving this goal. One of the interesting features of Malatesta's theory is that he views anarchy itself as both a goal and an ongoing process. Okay, I know I'm cutting in early here, but I just want to note there's also really nothing specific about that at all. Um, it seems a bit sophomoric to me, like, oh wow, it's both a method and the end state. Wow, you know, it's just, uh, okay, great, but, you know, what and how and, you know, why doesn't this uh, happen very often, by the way? Anarchist situations tend to be fairly short-lived. Um, also, I would mention about Marxism. Marxism is also a method. It is a way of thinking. Uh, it's scientific socialism. It's a way of analyzing historical conditions in order to come up with conclusions about how to advance whatever the situation is towards a classless, eventually stateless society. The idea, though, is, uh, you know, frequent anarchist criticism of Marxist states is like, oh, wow, why haven't you gotten rid of the state yet? Well, I don't know, because the United States still has nuclear weapons, possibly. Um, you know, think. Let's get back to the video. He refers to anarchy as a form of living together in society which has to be continuously produced and reproduced over time, rather than a static, unchanging utopia. This idea can be clearly seen in Malatesta's earlier writings. In 1891, he wrote that, By the free association of all, a social organization would arise through the spontaneous grouping of men according to their needs and sympathies, from the low to the high, from the simple to the complex, starting from the more immediate to arrive at the more distant and general interests. This organization would have for its aim the greatest good and fullest liberty to all. It would embrace all humanity in one common brotherhood 
and would be modified and improved as circumstances were modified and changed according to the teachings of experience. This society of free men, this society of friends, would be anarchy. Since anarchy is a society which will be continuously modified and improved over time, it follows that anarchy is above all a method. This method is, according to Malatesta, the free initiative of all, free agreement, and free association. Okay, sounds like a nice idea. Uh, I'm going to jump in to say, of course, we live in an exploiter society. We live in a society of class struggle, which has been going on for thousands of years. And what we know is that after we moved out of a hunter-gatherer type of arrangement, which was, you know, basically state of nature, you know, like other animals sort of hunt and gather, uh, they don't live with a surplus, in other words. When people started uh, doing farming and other kinds of improved uh, work methods that resulted in a surplus, this is where class divisions began because it, beca it became a question of struggle over who controls the surplus, you know, who uh, directs the work, who rules society, etc. And um, this was the emergence of ruling classes and ruled classes of exploiters and workers, etc. And we've been in that for several thousand years. Um, what Marxism seeks to do is to bring this era in human development, in overall human history, which has gone on for hundreds of thousands of years, um, trying to bring this period of several thousand years to a close, you know, we've invented technology. We're no longer hunter-gatherers. Uh, how do we bring this era of technology to some kind of a peaceful conclusion where we go back to living in more of a communist, you know, sharing, uh, equitable type of arrangement, but without the class struggle? And that's basically one of the aims of, of I mean, that's the aim of communism, ultimately. What we can really say concretely is how to take it from the step we're in to the next step, and maybe the next couple of steps with a little less certainty. How long this is going to take and, you know, what, you know, it's going to look like between steps 10 and 11 and 11 and 12, we don't know yet. Uh, Marxism is, again, above all, an analysis of historical conditions at a particular time. And a lot of stuff, you know, comes up along the way kind of by surprise. You can't predict everything. So, uh, you know, the further something is out, the less you can predict it, in other words. So, okay, great. But we are in a situation now where the planet is still dominated by capitalism. It's an exploiter world. Global imperialism is the order of the day. Uh, we see maybe some challenges to that arising now on a large scale. But how do we get from that situation into anarchy, this, you know, society of friends. Uh, hopefully the video will explain because so far it does sound like wishful thinking a bit. Let's continue. These two claims come together in the view that anarchy, in common with socialism, has as its basis, its point of departure, its essential environment, a quality of conditions. Its beacon is solidarity, and freedom is its method. It is not perfection, it is not the absolute ideal, which, like the horizon, recedes as fast as we approach it, but it is the way open to all progress and improvements for the benefit of everybody. Okay, so, you know, that's an interesting idea uh, that I think that more U.S. anarchists maybe should open themselves up to, because um, what I often see is anarchism cited as a sort of dodge of actually doing anything because as soon as you start trying to do things in the real world it doesn't match up to your perfect expectations of this totally horizontal you know situation with no hierarchy whatsoever etc cetera, etc cetera. and so there's a lot of talking and not much action that's a huge problem uh, it's good to hear from an anarchist anyway some recognition of practical implementation of these things not being ideal. Again, I hear a ton of idealistic talk, uh, and it's often used to shoot down more concrete plans of actually 
changing something because it's just not, you know, perfectly theoretically anarchist enough for various individuals to get involved with, to get started with in the real world, which is, of course, where the struggle is actually happening. Continuing. What Malatesta means by this is as follows. Anarchy's point of departure is a stateless, classless society in which the means of production are owned in common, and no person has the institutionalized power to impose their will on others via force. Okay, I know I'm jumping in a lot, but I need to say something again. So you look at this picture, it almost looks like something out of like, you know, a Bible study sort of religious literature. And while I'm sure at some point in this video they're going to talk more about the method of anarchism rather than the goal of anarchy, which I guess is pictured here. Okay, so listen to the way that it's stated. It's no individual can, you know, use force using the state as the means of oppressing people. It doesn't really address the question of why do we have a state in the first place. As I mentioned before, the purpose of the state is to basically guard and manage the surplus that society produces. How do we get to this place in the first place? Well, hunter-gatherers don't produce a surplus. They just live in equilibrium with what is in nature at any given time. And without tools to do anything, you can't really make much of a surplus to be guarded and gathered. Everybody had to work and everybody shared the products of it equally. This was primitive communism. But now that we're in a class society, it is not simply a matter of people deciding to act uh, differently that's going to get us out of it. So this whole idea of, you know, we will just uh, stop believing in the state uh, doesn't really fundamentally change anything. It's hard for me almost to comment on this because it's so obvious on its face. Uh, you know, the anarchist theory of, like, the development of the state is almost like, again, uh, you know, I mentioned before religious, it's like almost the Christian idea of the fall. Like, people just decided to be bad one day, and, you know, the state grew out of this. Um, that's really not what happened. It's not how we're going to get rid of it either. You know, there was a conversation I saw recently online where a large group of left comms and anarchists, rad libs, were insisting that socialism means no one works. And I said to these people, okay, so let's say 10, 15 years from now, the US empire has weakened itself to a point where revolts are actually successful, finally, against the United States. And people are able to start setting up parallel systems, you know, in a bid to challenge power. And let's say that in another five years, one of those efforts is successful and uh, capitalists are deposed. We start creating a new order. Tell me how no one works in that scenario 20 years from now. Tell me, you know, uh, I need a door for my house. How do I get that door? Who makes it? And what there was a lot of insistence of was you know, no, socialism means I can play video games all day. And some going as far as to say, I will burn down your factory. Okay, <laughs> so uh, how does that help anyone? Um, I get a sense, like, in other words, in trying to be charitable about whatever philosophical differences there are here, it is hard to take a lot of this stuff seriously. And I hope if you're listening to this as an anarchist, Maybe you've noticed some of this previously in your community. Maybe consider giving Marxism a bit more of a chance and hearing out, uh, you know, the accounts of historical struggles of Marxists and the theory and lessons that we have learned from that. Um, anyway, I'll leave it there, but already I'm getting sort of uh, my haunches up from like, we're not really doing this shit again, are we? It's hard for me to believe that people really can believe any of this seriously. We're just going to stop having a state one day because we decided not to. It just uh, flies in the face of all of, you know, the last few thousand years of history. All right. This not only creates a situation in which people are no longer subject to domination and exploitation by the ruling classes, it, in addition to this, establishes the real possibility 
for all people to do and be a wide variety of different things, since their ability to act is no longer limited by poverty, borders, government bureaucracy, having to work for a capitalist to survive, and so on. This equality of conditions is the social basis from which people can engage in an open-ended process of striving towards the goal of universal human cooperation at a societal level, and the formation of bonds of mutual support and love at the level of our day-to-day -day lives, with friends, family, partners, and so on. People living under anarchy will move towards the goal of solidarity through the method of forming voluntary horizontal associations. Aha, so voluntary horizontal associations will fix everything. That is the method, in other words. The method of attaining, uh, you know, overthrowing domination by the ruling classes and the real possibility for all people to do and be a wide variety of things because you're no longer limited by poverty and working for a capitalist, equality of conditions. Okay, so I would say that yes, uh, Marxism, communism also is about trying to advance a dignified life in which people uh, are not you know, held down by capitalists and forced to work just to increase capitalists' private wealth, which does not help society as a whole, and, you know, where workers are robbed at the point of production by the capitalist who owns all of the goods and services which they produce using the capitalist's workplace. Okay, great. When we get down to just voluntary horizontal associations, this is, I think, uh, maybe where some magical thinking starts getting involved. Let's proceed. These voluntary horizontal associations will then enter into free agreements with one another and establish a decentralized network capable of coordinating action over a large scale. Although violence may sometimes be necessary to defend spaces of cooperation from external attack or to overthrow the ruling classes, force cannot be used to establish cooperation among equals. If one tries to impose decisions on others through force, then the result will not be solidarity, but conflict, strife, and relations of command and obedience. Okay, so to me already, I hear some contradictions in this. So, we have voluntary horizontal associations, which may need to sometimes fight with each other. Well, what is preventing several of them to just gang up on other ones? and then you just have a situation of domination again. You're just sort of in a constant state of warfare at that point. Part of the way that communists get around this is making a national plan w for the economy where there is widespread agreement, and it's not done totally on a decentralized basis either. I mean, now we have computers and things that can do much more elaborate uh, economic planning and modeling than we had, say, 70 years ago or even 50 or 40 years ago. Uh, but the idea here being that some kind of centralized planning is key, otherwise you wind up just having capitalism again, or you wind up having to wake up every day and completely renegotiate the entire economy all over again. Also, there is the notion of everything is constantly based on free agreement, uh, this gives the impression of something that is, again, negotiated almost anew with each passing day. Uh, for anarchists interested in this kind of thing, I mean, if you look at the Soviet Union, for example, which had the right to secede and different things, I mean, there's a certain amount of balance that n practicality calls for. Uh, it's massively inefficient to spend all of your time in, you know, diplomatic negotiations about who is going to do what, and you wind up not being able to do anything, which is actually in practice what I've seen with anarchism on any kind of scale, whether it's a cooperative or anything. It's just oftentimes not very efficient. Now, there's a certain amount of, uh, you know, when you're incorporating democracy into any system, yes, there is some efficiency sacrificed for the sake of uh, people all, you know, having more buy-in and consent. Absolutely fine. But let's get to the other part of that, which is the free agreement part. Well, what happens when people don't agree? Um, what happens when people don't feel like they're getting a fair deal? Do you sit around and nothing gets done? 
uh, until you reach that agreement. Also, in general, the anarchist insistence on the individual being primary, which I haven't heard stated in this yet, but it is a common proposition among different schools of anarchism is they want everything to the individual, whereas communism says everything to the masses. It's through mass struggle that we you know, obtain any rights and dignity for ourselves. Uh, whereas for anarchists, they don't even necessarily recognize the rule of the majority because the individual is primary. So when people, anarchists in particular, ideological anarchists, dissent from whatever the standing agreement is, uh, what then? So you just have a situation of lots of conflict in the name of, you know, having this horizontal, everything is free, freely agreed upon kind of situation. The reality is when groups of people make agreements, uh, they need to be in effect for a certain amount of time. And if people don't like it, they can try to renegotiate it later. Or, you know, I mean, if it's really grievous, I mean, do something about it even before the agreed upon period of time is up. But you don't necessarily want a thing where you're waking up, uh, you know, every day or every week or even every month and trying to come up with new terms for what you're doing. Uh, also, <laughs> I, I know I'm just going on here, but the idea of having the classless society in which the state gradually withers away, there's a fundamental premise here of a very high level of technological development where we've overcome the problem of surplus effectively by having uh, practically infinite surplus. In other words, the surplus is no longer in jeopardy, at least, you know, where it needs to be guarded and ruled over as closely as in past eras. Uh, so far, I haven't really heard any recognition of that. This is really more idealist in that it's working pretty much purely in the realm of moral decisions rather than, um, you know, recognizing that what are we fighting over? We're fighting over stuff primarily. Let's continue. The achievement of genuine solidarity requires that people come to agreements which best suit everyone involved and must therefore be established voluntarily. This process of striving for solidarity through the method of freedom will result in a wide variety of experiments in different forms of life. Through a process of trial and error, people will over time establish new social structures and relations which do a superior job of maximizing the equality, solidarity, and freedom of humanity. These new social structures and relations will, in turn, lay the foundations from which future improvements can occur, and so on and on. As Malatesta wrote in 1899, anarchist ideals are the experimental system brought from the field of research to that of social realization. Malatesta does not think that the establishment of anarchy will occur automatically, or that humans naturally create anarchy. Anarchy only exists if it is consciously produced and reproduced by human action. As he wrote in 1897, The belief in some natural law, whereby harmony is automatically established between men, without any need for them to take conscious, deliberate action, is hollow and utterly refuted by the facts. Even if the state and private property were to be done away with, harmony does not come to pass automatically, as if nature busies herself with men's blessings and misfortunes, but rather requires that men themselves create it. All right, so this is a pretty slow video so far, I gotta say, I've not really learned very much from this. Um, I will say though, I agree with uh, Malatesta's statement there that even if the state and private property were to be done away with, harmony does not come to pass automatically, but rather requires that people create it. Uh, yes. So it, it's almost odd to me that anarchists are, you know, while there were socialist internationals going on, anarchists were off in a corner uh, sort of reinventing all of these things, except taking out all of the sort of steps of concrete struggle and theories of, you know, let's say a worker state to get a system like this going in the first place, trying to learn from historical lessons, say, 
the Paris Commune, for example, uh, it, it just seems like a lot of stargazing to me, uh, rather than actually, uh, you know, applying historical lessons. So, I, I don't know, um, you know, as far as this thing that they said about genuine solidarity coming from, I mean, are they just talking about class interests? Because we talk about that in Marxism. It sounds like, yeah, you want an, a social arrangement that actually reflects people's class interests. That's how you get the masses to buy in. What do you then have to do with the uh, smaller ruling classes, capital? Uh, what do you do with them when their class interests are no longer represented in socialism? Well, you have to come up with a system of suppressing their interests, the bourgeoisie and the petty bourgeoisie. You have to make a system, a workers' government, which will then suppress them. That's basically the idea. If you don't have this, your thing will fall apart immediately because the capitalists will reassert themselves as any even casual study of socialist revolutions will tell you. The first thing that capitalists do is they get all the armies and mercenaries that they can to try to invade you and reprivatize your shit. That is just what is shown every single time. So I'm hearing things in this about the method of freedom, uh, I, that means nothing in and of itself. We need some examples. And again, I think this is why you don't see many anarchist revolutions uh, that last very long at all. There may be some uprisings or some people living in a countercultural way uh, in you know certain circumstances. Maybe that's the best you feel you can pull off. But it certainly isn't adding up to a movement to, you know, uh, basically out-organize, outpace, and then suppress capitalism. I don't hear that at all. Let's, in fact, you know, capitalists talk in these same terms about, you know, the method of freedom and things like that. Um, anyway, th this opens up a larger conversation. Let's see where this goes still. I'm, I'm honestly still kind of waiting for some meat, some heft <laughs> to this video. This exact point was repeated by Malatesta in 1925. He wrote, Anarchy is a human aspiration which is not to be founded on any true or supposed natural law, and which may or may not come about depending on human will. If anarchy is a product of human will, then it follows that anarchy could be ended if humans choose to oppress others and establish relations of domination and subordination. This is a danger that Malatesta was aware of. He wrote in 1899 that, If anyone in some future society sought to oppress someone else, the latter would have the right to resist them and to fight force with force. Anarchy was therefore a society based on freedom for all and in everything, with no limit other than the equal freedom of others, which does not mean that we embrace and wish to respect the freedom to exploit oppress, command, which is oppression and not freedom. Okay, this is very boring to me in just how rudimentary these concepts are. Yeah, uh, that is oppression. That's not going to stop people from doing it. Uh, this is what we call class struggle. Why do we have class struggle? We have class struggle because we came out of primitive communism when we started developing different uh, ways to meet our needs through using tools. And um, I mean, that's a whole conversation in itself. But there's really no attempt that I can hear, at least in any of these quotes, to reckon with the origins and underpinnings of the system. And consequently, all of these formulations of, well, anarchy would be this or anarchy would be that, it's not tied to anything. It's just sort of like grasping in the dark at possible ideas of freedom. I, I really, by this point, Marxism had been rolling along, you know, by 1898, Marxism had been rolling along uh, for 50 years. And how did Marx and Engels start? They started by taking all of the existing socialist and anarchist concepts and philosophers and by rigorously scrutinizing and criticizing them, taking anything that worked and discarding what didn't, and 
this is how they came up with the system of historical materialism, dialectical materialism, and the theory of how to uh, confront capitalism with a new system, socialism, which would be based on the class interests of the proletariat, a specific type of class which was created specifically by capitalism. There had been proletarians in scattered numbers in previous eras of class struggle, but really capitalism reduces everyone to this class of propertyless wage workers uh, over time. The longer that capitalism exists in a society, that is the specific type of inequality and the specific type of class structures in society that it creates. It proletarianizes. So therefore, if you're trying to get out of capitalism, what is in the proletariat's interest? Okay, well, getting rid of private property. It's just, um, there's a real poverty of thought to this, at least in the quotes that are being selected. I, I imagine somebody in a closet, a dark closet, just sort of grasping at hallucinations. I, I don't hear anything tying this to the real world. Uh, you can do both. You can talk about human behavior and, you know, human needs and interests, and you can also tie it to the world of the ongoing class struggle that has, again, been going on for thousands of years. And you're probably going to get further if you do that latter thing. That is the essence of Marxism. So, again, I just hear grasping in the dark here, but let's continue. A crucial aspect of reproducing anarchy as a social system is therefore ensuring that relations of domination and exploitation do not arise in the first place, and that, if they do somehow arise, they are quickly defeated. Malatesta does not provide many details on how to do this, because he thought this was a question which would be settled through large groups of people engaging in a process of experimentation with different forms of association. Modern anarchists can, however, look at anthropological evidence on how really existing stateless societies reproduce themselves. They do not provide exact blueprints which we can follow like an instruction manual for creating a free society, but they can be useful sources of inspiration. It okay, so again, we seemingly have a nod here to the Marxist principle of understanding historical conditions as the basis for what is possible within a particular society. Okay, great, glad to hear it. Um, when we get into these historical examples of anarchism, though, I'm wondering if they're going to be from the far-flung past. <laughs> uh, you know, in other words, primitive communism. Because that doesn't have that much bearing on where we are at today, unless you also start going down the rabbit hole of, like, anarcho-primitivism. Reactionary views of, like, reducing the level of technology dramatically, uh, creating less efficient production, more work, more risk for everyone. Uh, nobody's going to want to do that. That is always going to be a fringe reactionary view. I mean, the ruling classes don't want it because the higher the level of technology, the more surplus their workers are producing. And workers don't want it because if we're ever going to inherit that world, uh, you know, obviously through revolution, then uh, why would you want to set yourself backwards in the first place deliberately? It just, it just makes no sense. Let's see what kind of examples they come up with. Should, in addition to this, be kept in mind that some stateless societies are hierarchical in other ways, such as men oppressing women or adults oppressing children. There is a tendency for people raised in societies with states to assume that the true or correct endpoint of human cultural evolution is the creation of a society with a state. Wait, I thought we were going to do examples. Um, also, I mean, the adults oppressing children. Yes, youth rights. Also, uh, children have less knowledge. So, anyway, there's a certain amount of that. Obviously, don't oppress children, but um, yeah, that's... Are we getting into the like the bedtime discourse here? Where are we going with this? All right, now we've mentioned examples, but and maybe they'll come back to that, but now we're on to we only think that states are necessary because everyone for the last several thousand years has been raised in a society which has a state. Again, 
None of this addresses why there are states. It is the people are bad theory, essentially, uh, which, well, if, you know, the reason why states arise is people are bad, then the way out is people need to be good. This is utter idealism. Um, it's not going to get you anywhere. So it's more of a religious type thinking, actually. So, all right, hopefully they get somewhere with this. <laughs> Those who live in stateless societies are therefore viewed as inferior people who have failed to realize the best way of organizing society. In response to this way of thinking, the anthropologist Pierre Clastres has suggested that stateless societies should not be viewed as societies without a state, but instead as societies against the state. That is to say, people do not live in stateless societies by chance, they have instead developed political philosophies about the kind of society they want to live in, and consciously created social structures to ensure that a society without rulers is reproduced. Members of stateless societies have not failed to realise the possibility of a society in which a ruling minority imposes their will on everyone else through violence. They have instead deliberately chosen to create a different kind of society, Clastres writes, in what I consider to be outdated and problematic language, that Primitive societies do not have a state because they refuse it. Because they refuse the division of the social body into the dominating and the dominated. The politics of the savages is, in fact, to constantly hinder the appearance of a separate organ of power, to prevent the fatal meeting between the institution of chieftainship and the exercise of power. In primitive society, there is no separate organ of power, because power is not separated from society. Society, as a single totality, holds power in order to maintain its undivided being, to ward off the appearance in its breast of the inequality between masters and subjects, between chief and tribe. The refusal of inequality and the refusal of separate powers are the same, constant concern of primitive societies. Okay, so exactly as I thought, we're using the example of so-called primitive communism, or basically something very close to the hunter-gatherer natural state of the human organism. I mean, basically, like any other primate, humans evolved in, you know, living in extended, uh, you know, tribes of several dozen doing work together to survive. Everybody had to pitch in with the gathering and the hunting, and uh, everybody shared equally because you couldn't... Uh, I mean, you had to rely on everyone's labor. Everybody had to be fed, and so on. But what this anarchist take does not factor in, these societies, it's not um, just that they've chosen this. They have no need for a state. It's what I was saying before. They have, they produce no surplus, and therefore there is no need to set up a body to guard the surplus. Okay, that's why they don't have a state. They don't need one. Everybody works equally for everyone's survival, but that's also the level that they live on is pure subsistence and survival. So famine is a real problem because there is no surplus. Or, you know, it can be if uh, weather doesn't cooperate and you don't migrate to the right place or whatever. So, anyway, I, this is pretty fundamental here. And they're trying to ascribe to just a choice. Like, oh, you could have a, uh, you know, quote, primitive hunter-gatherer type society, pre-technological society that has a state, but they choose not to. They, they don't have a state because they don't need one. It would just seem absurd but as soon as you start getting out of that again go study marxism because we've explained all of this in material terms there's a material reason why the state arose and we're still in that era and yes it's yielded huge exploitation and the people in the ruling class they take a lot of stuff for themselves that i think most of us agree they shouldn't have for themselves. We made it, and we need it, and we should share all that stuff. If you agree with that point of view, well, great, you agree with Marxism. 
Uh, but this sort of anarchist metaphysics of like, you know, anybody could have a state at any time. It's just a state of mind. That really ignores the actual anthropological evolution of these institutions in class society. So I don't know if there's going to be any nod to this at all, but this quote on the screen, I reject it. I really can't accept this at all. This point has recently been made in much greater depth by the anthropologist Christopher Bohm. He argues that egalitarian stateless societies are the product of human intentionality, and that the immediate cause of egalitarianism is conscious, and that deliberate social control is directed at preventing the expression of hierarchical tendencies. One of the main ways egalitarian stateless societies achieve this is through the use of horizontal decision-making processes in which the group makes collective decisions through consensus between all involved. Any leaders which do exist lack the power to impose decisions on others through coercion, and must instead persuade others to act in a certain way through oratory skill alone. This usually goes alongside a variety of behavioural expectations which the leader has to conform to in order to remain in their position, such as the leader being modest, in control of their emotions, good at resolving disputes, and generous. The emphasis on generosity can be so strong that leaders are expected to share large amounts of their possessions with others, especially those in need. This often results in leaders possessing the smallest number of things in the entire group, due to them having to give so many items away. Egalitarian stateless societies have, in addition to this, developed various mechanisms to respond to what Bohm labels upstartism. Upstartism includes any behaviour which threatens the autonomy and equality of the group, such as bullying, being selfishly greedy, issuing orders, taking on airs of superiority, engaging in acts of physical violence, and so on. Okay, but... You literally just showed a guy whose book has a picture of chimpanzees on it. To say that this is not current historical conditions is a massive understatement. I mean, we've diverged biologically, <laughs> like uh, from you know whatever common ancestor we have with chimpanzees. Uh, this is not relevant, really, to the kinds of problems we're trying to solve today other than in a very, very general sense. Um, so, I mean, that was a big miss. I'm really waiting for the examples here. Something other than hunter-gatherer society or like the way that primates live, non-human primates live, really. So, okay, back to the video. In order to implement the ethical values of the community, members of egalitarian stateless societies will respond to upstartism with a wide range of different social sanctions. This includes, but is not limited to, criticism, gossiping, public ridicule, ignoring what they say, ostracism, expulsion from the group, and even, in some extreme cases, execution. Social sanctions are applied to all members of the group, but leaders in particular, this is due to the fact that leaders are subject to a greater deal of public scrutiny, and viewed as one of the main places where relations of domination and subordination could emerge. This, in turn, creates a situation where leaders will, in order to maintain their position and avoid being subject to sanctions, engage in the socially prescribed behaviour that is expected from them, such as sharing huge amounts of their belongings, even if they would rather not do so. The system of sanctions, therefore, not only effectively counters acts of domination, but also reproduces the horizontal structure of the group itself. The manner in which members of egalitarian stateless societies respond to upstartism can be subtle. Bohm gives the example of the Kun, who have developed various ways of dealing with the problem of successful male hunters coming to think of themselves as superior to everyone else, and, as a result, becoming more likely to engage in domination, especially murder. Okay, but this is not the fundamental issue we're talking about. 
I mean, we're not trying to come up with a system of criminology or the enforcement of social norms here. What you're talking about in this video is basically how people who are materially equal prevent people within that materially equal society uh, from being interpersonally bad to each other or maybe, you know, robbing their share of food or something like that. And but we're, once you get into class society, which again, stop showing hunter gatherer examples because we don't live in a hunter gatherer society. We don't live in a materially equal society. We live in a society with a ruling class and a vast surplus produced by high technology. This is no longer the same. So, yeah, within, say, a school classroom, you know, where all the kids are the same age and they all have the same power and the same basic materials. I mean, some kids' uh, parents are going to be richer, they're going to have nicer sneakers or whatever. But basically, within the functional school day, they all have basically the same you know, standing. It, it's a matter of how they treat each other. Okay, fine. But that's not, uh, you're not going to bring an, an end to, you know, the kind of massive class divisions that we have. Uh, you know, it wasn't a lack of shaming people that led to these sort of massive wealth divisions. Uh, and you're not going to get them back purely by doing that it's just fundamentally misunderstanding the situation that we're in so you know anarchists stop using hunter-gatherer societies as examples challenge i'm laying it out there now it's just not relevant because we don't live in a society where people are material equals it's a completely different situation firstly large game meat is shared equally among the group by the person who is credited with killing the animal the credit for the kill does not go to the person who loosed the actual killing arrow, but instead to the owner of the first arrow to hit the animal. This will often not even be someone who went on the hunt, due to the male hunters regularly trading arrows with one another. This social system ensures that credit for the hunt is randomised. Hunters are less likely to be envious of other hunters. Every member of the group has access to protein, and the most skilled or lucky hunters are not able to easily use this fact to develop power and influence over others. Secondly, the Kun actively use humour and social etiquette to ensure that successful hunters do not put themselves on a pedestal. An unnamed member of the Kun explains this as follows. Say that a man has been hunting. He must not come home and announce like a braggart, I have killed a big one in the bush. He must first sit down in silence, until I, or someone else, comes up to his fire and asks, What did you see today? He replies quietly, Ah, oh, I'm no good for hunting, I saw nothing at all. Maybe just a tiny one. Then I smile to myself, because I now know he has killed something big. Even after the hunter has deliberately acted as if they haven't been very successful, other members of the group will make jokes about them and express their disappointment. The unnamed member of the Kun explains that when people go to collect the dead animal, they will say things like, You mean to say that you have dragged us all the way out here to make us cart home your pile of bones? Oh, if I had known it was this fin, I wouldn't have come. People, to think I gave up a nice day in the shade for this. At home we may be hungry, but at least we have nice cool water to drink. The conscious motivation behind this behaviour is explained by a healer as follows. When a young man kills much meat, he comes to think of himself as a chief or a big man, and he thinks of the rest of us as his servants or inferiors. We can't accept this. We refuse one who boasts, for some day his pride will make him kill somebody. So we always speak of his meat as worthless. In this way we cool his heart and make him gentle. The Kun have, in other words, intentionally developed a complex social system based on their political philosophy, which ensures the reproduction of an egalitarian stateless society and actively prevents the rise of domination within their midst. So for me, this is pretty disappointing. Um, again, <laughs> societies of this type 
require everyone in the community to be strong and fairly well nourished. So whereas capitalism doesn't really, it treats workers as expendable. A certain percentage of workers are unemployed at any given period of time. It's a completely different method of production. In fact, what's the word? You might even say it's a different mode of production in which not everything tracks one to one. So, okay, I get it. In this society where people are materially equal, uh, they're sharing the wealth equally because they rely for the collective survival of the group. They can't have any oppression within their group because if they start not feeding somebody, well, that's the person who needed to you know, put together the raft or something, and then you got no raft. It's really different in a high-tech mass production society. And hence, we have different challenges facing us in this era. So again, on a small scale between material equals, yeah, great. You have, you know, identified things that people do uh, in order to prevent bullies or, and again, I would, you know, cite the grade school classroom as an example. It's like people get a big head, even though, you know, somebody will be a little taller or a little more attractive than somebody else, or, you know, their parents can buy them better clothes or whatever it is. And, you know, they get a big head and then other people resent it. So you get pushed back. But in the end, nobody's quite oppressing each other. You're still basically getting the same education and you're getting the same, you know, within that particular school, classroom, et cetera. You're basically getting the same stuff. It's not resulting in like an actual oppression of, you know, some classmates against others, et cetera. Uh, that's all held in place by an overarching system sets those bounds. So... What sets the bounds in hunter-gatherer societies? Well, basically nature itself. I mean, the limits of productive power, of simple uh, handmade tools, and you can only do so much with those tools. Well, so then you have to live within the, you know, what you can obtain for yourself out of that. And again, people have to really cooperate in a situation like that, or everybody dies. The whole thing fails. So again, I would say that there are material reasons for that. And, you know, if anarchism as a way of life is just a video kind of so far about people just being nice to each other in really different historical conditions where people are materially equal, much unlike today, I can't say that it has all that much value. Uh, there's about another 10 minutes left, but I, again, I'm just not hearing <laughs> a lot that I would, you know, the reason that I started this channel, Socialism for All, and going through Marxist theory and history from the last 100, 150 or so years is to try to solve the political problems we face today because we have significant problems, the economic, political, social, you know, realities that we experience and we need answers, you know, to that. Uh, I'm not hearing it here. Unless, again, you want to pretend we can revert to a hunter-gatherer society. Uh, no. All right. Although people living in industrial societies do not have to develop social norms around successful hunters, we do have our equivalents. For example, successful influencers sometimes let the fame get to their head, come to think of themselves as superior to other people, and then treat others as inferior to them, and engage in acts of domination. Think Jake Paul. No, don't think Jake Paul. You're using influencers as an example? What I, I'm just this video is uh, this is a joke, right? I mean, I'm, I'm astonished. I don't even know what else to say. No, that isn't a good example. It's not relevant at all. I don't even know what to say. This is like literally the grade school example that I was just, you know, I made that comparison to show how it isn't <laughs> comparable. Uh, I, I don't even understand this. Moving on. My fellow Jake Paulers. It is, of course, the case that those of us currently living under the domination of capitalism, the state, patriarchy, racism, queer phobia, ableism, and so on, are most likely a long way away from achieving anarchy at a societal level. We are not confronted with the problem of reproducing anarchy as a stateless, classless society, we instead face the challenge of living under oppressive systems, whilst attempting to implement the methods of anarchism 
within both our intimate relationships with friends, family, partners, etc., and social movements aimed at the abolition of all systems of domination and exploitation. Okay, so here's usually what it comes down to, is some kind of lifestyleism as a substitute for the mass action that this basically cannot deliver, but trying to accept these extremely micro-scale uh, you know, substitutes as valid. They are not. They do not really confront capitalism at all, and they start a process of navel-gazing and tail-chasing that really is unproductive. So do not take this advice. You know, lifestyleism is not a valid substitute. Uh, you know, look at the way capitalism is literally destroying our world. It must be stopped. And setting your sights on anything less is really not going to cut it. But yet you do see anarchists wholeheartedly focusing on that instead. In order to do so, we must establish horizontal social relations which are, as far as is possible, the same as those that would constitute anarchy. In so doing, we can simultaneously a. construct the world as we wish it was, during the struggle against the world as it is, and b. develop through a process of experimentation in the present, the real methods of organisation, decision-making, and association that people in the future could use to achieve the states of affairs that characterise anarchy. If, as Malatesta argued, tomorrow can only grow out of today, then we must build organisations based upon the will and in the interest of all their members, not only tomorrow in order to meet all the needs of social life, but also today for the purposes of propaganda and struggle. We must, in other words, engage in prefigurative politics, or to use historical anarchist language, build the embryo of the human society of the future. The pockets of freedom we manage to create within class society are of course not anarchy. Anarchy is a social system in which all forms of class rule have been abolished and socialism has been achieved. Anarchy cannot therefore be said to exist just because a horizontal association has been built within the cage of capitalism and the state. Although horizontal associations within class society are not anarchy, they are the means through which anarchy can be achieved. That is to say, horizontal associations should be organs of class struggle, which unite workers together in order to both win immediate improvements, such as higher wages or stopping the fossil fuel industry, and ultimately overthrow the ruling classes. Horizontal associations should, at the same time, be social structures which are constituted by forms of activity that develop their participants into the kinds of people who are both capable of, and driven to, establish and reproduce anarchy. For example, a group of workers form a tenant union, use direct action to prevent their landlord from evicting them, and at the same time, learn how to make decisions within a general assembly. In changing the world, workers at the same time change themselves. Okay, yeah, so in socialism we say that engaging in class struggle tends to sharpen class consciousness. So, similar concept here. And, you know, anybody, for example, familiar with an early example, the 1905 Russian Revolution, after which Soviets were set up, what were the Soviets? They were councils of workers that, uh, you know, were used to direct ongoing class struggle. So, I don't know, you know, what do the anarchists do during this time? A lot of times it's wrecking. I mean, they have kind of a long history uh, of being named as wreckers because, you know, workers will get some of these things going and then it just won't be pure enough for the anarchists. I don't know. I'm running out of comments on this video. It's just so tiresome to me to, like, hear this stuff, regurgitate this very nonspecific stuff regurgitated over and over again it creates a lot of idealism in people that is not grounded in any way to realize the aims again coming from the materialist historical materialist outlook of marxism we try to do that from the get-go to change society by being rooted in society not just applying an ideal 
to a situation which maybe may or may not, you know, be able to mesh with it at all. Um, you know, having moved on from this a long time ago myself, it's just sort of depressing. I like I remember how much I still didn't understand when I you know had my flirting with anarchism period, and um, how much better off now I feel I am having studied more about Marxist history and theory. Um, anarchism didn't really bring me, I feel like everything I learned from anarchism, I learned in the first six months, maybe. And then I really was left wanting after that. Uh, Marxism was the extension because these basic ideas are pretty good. But if you want to actually study the current conditions that we're in and how to do anything within that, Marxism is going to be about a thousand times more helpful in my view than anarchism um we got another five minutes here but yeah given the insights of both historical anarchist theory and modern anthropology a crucial aspect of laying the foundations from which anarchy could emerge in the future is establishing effective methods for maintaining the horizontality of a group this includes at least a deliberately structuring organizations so as to ensure that they are self-managed by their membership, such as making decisions through general assemblies in which everyone has a vote, coordinating action over a large scale via informal networks or formal federations, electing instantly recallable mandated delegates to perform specific tasks, and so on. b. Consciously developing a system of social sanctions which effectively and proportionally respond to situations where a member engages in what Bohm terms upstartism. This is especially necessary for when people attempt to establish themselves in positions of power at the top of an informal hierarchy, or engage in an act of domination. One of the most important situations which a group must effectively respond to is when a member emotionally, physically, or sexually abuses another person. It is, in addition to this, very important that any sanction system which is implemented is not itself a new form of domination disguised as mere opposition to the domination of others. Okay, on point A, I would say that the closest that modern human societies have gotten to these points is what we would call the various forms of, quote, state socialism, which anarchists almost never give credit to and just shit on, make them equivalent to something, you know, like the most oppressive imperialist countries. And it's just not true. As for point B, this is really at a micro level, which, okay, it's fine. Um, but to literally make that point B, and to put it ahead of so many other questions, strikes me as extraordinarily idealist. There's not a single mention in here about production or distribution of anything. And I guess the cop-out would be we're leaving that up to the members, but can you? It just doesn't really examine these questions at all, suggesting to me an extreme superficiality. Um, let's try to finish this out. This is getting really boring to me. In summary, anarchy is a form of living together in society which must be consciously and intentionally produced and reproduced by human action. A crucial part of doing so is developing social structures and relations which maintain the horizontality of groups and prevent new forms of domination and exploitation from arising. Given modern anthropological evidence on how really existing stateless societies reproduce themselves, this will include developing social sanctions to respond to what Bohm terms upstartism. Although we do not currently live under anarchy, we must establish horizontal associations which engage in class struggle against the ruling classes and prefigure the methods of organization, decision-making, and association which would exist in a free society. This includes developing effective sanction systems which proportionally respond to behavior that threatens the horizontality of the group. Doing so will, just like under anarchy, require a process of experimentation with different forms of life in order to figure out which solutions actually work and are compatible with anarchist goals and values.
1999, Malatesta wrote that, Anarchy cannot come but little by little, slowly but surely, growing in intensity and extinction. Therefore, the subject is not whether we accomplish anarchy today, tomorrow, or within ten centuries, but that we walk towards anarchy, today, tomorrow, and always. Through a process of walking towards anarchy, we must learn how to live as equals within a free horizontal association, and in so doing, become fit to establish a society with neither masters nor subjects. Yeah, so I hear faint traces of the ideas within Marxism, but in some of the most watered-down forms that I've heard in a long time. And, you know, I mean, what I do here on this channel is primarily audiobooks of Marxist history and theory, keeping in mind, again, that what Marx and Engels basically started with was taking all existing anti-capitalist ideology and refining and improving it, and oftentimes relentlessly mocking it as they stripped things out of it. Anarchism is like what was left over, basically, when they did that. I mean, this idiotic picture on the screen right here, um, I don't know, what's, what is this supposed to uh, accomplish for anybody? But um, So as for these points of consciously reproducing these new norms, well, you know what would be an efficient way of doing that? I don't know, setting up an organization to educate people in that and to, you know, enforce the... Oh, wait, sort of like a state. But this is what you get into with anarchists. The further that anarchists get away from idealism. And I did see somebody commenting on this video uh, on Twitter, I think it was, saying least idealist anarchist, which is still, you know, quite idealist. But the further that an anarchist gets away from idealism, the more that they start to realize that putting any of this into practice, you're actually talking about socialism. And, um, you know, this whole system of a federation and this and that, oh, almost like a union of workers and peasants, <laughs> Soviets, right? No, 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 not that. And this is, you know, of course, the meme is like, is this the anarchist state? Oh, no, it's not a state, you know, and then a wall of text. And it's like, yep, this is it. Yeah, because there is a fundamental need as part of class struggle to protect your new society and to teach people the ways. You know, if we do need to consciously produce and reproduce these new norms, you're basically talking about a worker state. Anyway, but as far as, and a couple of other points, the sanction systems, oh, I mean, get involved in an anarchist organization. You will spend most of your time talking about sanction systems and enforcing on a day-to-day -day basis the purity of that. Oh my God, just no. Uh, no, I want no part of that. On to this quote, though, from Malatesta about, you know, anarchy little by little over 10 centuries. Um, it almost sounds to me like this notion of anarchism is outside the class struggle. So in other words, they'd be going on with this process, uh, whether we're in capitalism or feudalism or socialism, they're still going to be the ones pressing this like ultra horizontal version, uh, whether or not that is supportable or productive within like, a given uh, set of circumstances. I would almost say anarchists take themselves outside of this uh, entire struggle by doing that. And in fact, that was the way that they were treated by socialists in the past is basically, you know, no, you cannot join these organizations. You're not a party. You're not anything. You're just these people who relentlessly criticize things for not being hierarchical enough. You're not really contributing productively to the struggle. So go away. <laughs> and um, I mean, this is still the way that I feel today. Now, as I said before, I do think that the broader left needs to work together on some things. But I, I got to say also, I mean, anarchist ideology, it's kind of a joke. And I wonder how many anarchists today have seriously studied anything else because it's just, uh, it's sort of the weakest possible version of a lot of these ideas. Anyway, I think it was just another minute or two. I'm sure that we will make mistakes along the way, but these mistakes must be treated as opportunities to learn and develop. 
rather than reasons to abandon the march towards anarchy. In the words of the Spanish anarchist Isaac Puente, Living in libertarian communism will be like learning to live. Its weak points and its failings will be shown up when it is introduced. If we were politicians, we would paint a paradise brimful of perfections. Being human, and being aware what human nature can be like, we trust that people will learn to walk the only way it is possible for them to learn. By walking. Okay, so I'm not that familiar with Puente's work, but this quote is interesting to me because they seem to have a different set of standards for their own, quote, libertarian communism, which, as he says, if we were politicians, we would paint a paradise brimful of perfections, but, you know, we recognize that in reality, uh, it's not going to be this instant utopia. That's interesting because actually that is how anarchists tend to treat every single socialist revolution that there is. So why the double standard? To me, it smacks of insincerity and again wrecking. I hope everyone listening liked the video. All right. Well, I really did not. It's nothing personal to anarcho pack. I just think that these ideas don't really offer us that much. And, you know, anarcho pack didn't come up with them. But making videos about this still, I don't think it's helpful. Anarchism has had a really poor track record uh, over, you know, well, I mean, it's basically a competitor with socialism, Marxism. And which has the more successful set of outcomes? I mean, this is pretty settled by now. And I didn't hear many specifics in here. And again, it, it seems like a watered down version of socialism. If you want uh, a version of these ideas, which is implementable in reality, just study Marxism, honestly. It, it's what they're grasping after but can never really achieve. And with that, I'm going to end this video here and move on to the next one. Thanks for listening. Leave a comment below to continue the discussion. Uh, if you're trying to just bash Marxism, don't do that because you will be banned. Uh, I'm not interested in anything like that. So thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to support, patreon.com slash socialism for all and get your name on the screen. Otherwise, liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting all help to boost the channel without a donation. Whatever it is that you do in your community and online to spread the ideas of socialism, thanks for doing it, and join a good organization if there's one in your area. We'll catch you in the next video.